Okay, welcome to um, Bridges of Belonging. This is uh, episode number 22 and uh, super excited to have our incredible guests Jeff McLean and Tammy Sang join us today and I will introduce them in just a moment. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional territory that I'm coming to you from today, which is that of the Coast Salish people, home to the Esquimalt, Songhees and Lasonic Nations in Victoria. My name is Andrea Carey. I'm the Chief Inclusion Officer with Inclusion Incorporated and uh, your host for today's episode of Bridges of Belonging. I uh, also want to just start with a reading. We um, typically have the opportunity to share something that uh, kind of connects to what our uh, speakers bring to the table today. So I'm going to begin with a reading from Richard Wagamese Embers. And uh, he's one of my favorite authors and just always really appreciate his words of wisdom. So today's reading, love is not always the perfection of moments or the sum of all the shining days. Sometimes it's to drift apart, to be broken, to be disassembled by life and living, but always to come back together and to be each other's glue again. Love is an act of life and we are made more by the living. And um, for those of you that received our newsletter yesterday, we certainly feel like love is an important theme um, right now in our world and in how um, we support each other and take care of each other. And February is always kind of a month of love, a bit of a theme around Valentine's Day, but uh, I think this year more than ever, we really need to just appreciate each other, appreciate ourselves, appreciate how we show up. and. Um, what folks need to be supported during these challenging times. So with that, I'm going to introduce our two incredible speakers who are both doing work to uh, spread love and acceptance and understanding within the work that they each do. So Jeff McLean is one of the founders of Pride Tape, an international movement designed to bring inclusivity and support to the LGBTQ plus community, primarily through hockey. Their signature rainbow hockey tape has become the base of the NHL's Hockey is for Everyone campaign, which is in February, that's why we have Jeff on today, um, and has grown internationally to be a symbol of acceptance and change. And Tammy Sang, she, her, is the co-founder of Anne Humanity, an inclusive marketing agency, which has just become one of our strategic partners with Inclusion Incorporated. She's an agency owner and a brand value strategist. As a maverick business owner, she holds a lifelong passion for diversity and inclusion. She's a second generation Cantonese immigrant settler, a mother, a daughter, a wife, a friend, and a confidant, and someone that I've been really enjoying getting to know as we've been working together over the last uh, few months. So welcome to Jeff and Tammy. Um, Tammy, do you wanna kick us off by telling us a little bit about your story and uh, your journey of belonging? Sure, sure. Um, so I have been kind of in the marketing world for quite some time for about ugh, a decade um, or so. Um, and then when I had my son uh, a few years ago, I had a lot of late nights, you know, <laughs> with your son. I don't know if you any of you have any experience with that, but I uh, started to rethink my life a little bit and, and what really mattered to me. Um, the agency really fell on my lap in many ways. Um, so when I started to think about, you know, what's um, the red string, um, which is a reference to an uh, uh, artist who talks about what ties your life together, I thought about all the work that was really meaningful to me, and it was always around belonging. Um, I ran a conference called XY Boom Intergenerational Conference. I worked at CBC Television, helping Alden Tabakon, who's a, um, um, a diversity, equity, inclusion expert. Um, bring inclusion into the workplace at CBC. Um, and I realized that those were the most meaningful points in my life. Um, so after running an agency for a very long time and continue to, I realized that it would be really neat to bring it into the space. Um, so did a little bit of research and realized that um, there, while there were you know, a lot of lived experience, there wasn't actually a lot of measurement and application. Um, the diligence that was created in diversity, equity, inclusion for organizational structure, um, that kind of diligence wasn't brought to marketing and communication. So I've been sp spending the last few years working with BI experts like Andrea to, to build out a framework uh, so that we can measure it and so that we can talk about it in a more meaningful way. 
Um, so that's a little bit about my journey. Awesome. Thanks so much, Tammy. That's a great start for us and uh, appreciate the intro to you. And um, I know we're going to learn a lot more about your journey as we uh, go through this conversation today. So Jeff, over to you to share your story. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you for inviting me today. I too, like Tammy, have a marketing background. I've been in the agency world for 30 years or longer. I think you lose track when you're in it that long. But uh, I'm in it from the background of art director, creative director for many agencies, uh, currently working for an agency called uh, Ray Agency out of St. John's, Newfoundland. And I work uh, in Newfoundland from my basement here in Edmonton, and I've worked with them for, for quite some time. Um, I also uh, volunteer in my, in my spare time. Uh, I call myself one of the brand custodians of the Pride Tape team, uh, which there are a number of us. Um, I got involved with Pride Tape when I was working uh, at the agency Calder Bateman Communications here in Edmonton five years ago. In fact, Pride Tape, this is perfect timing, Andrea, Pride Tape's birthday or fifth anniversary is tomorrow uh, when the Kickstarter campaign was reached. Um, came up with the Pride Tape idea actually inspired by a friend and colleague of mine, Pierre Chan, who works in Vancouver. Uh, he created uh, nohomophobes.com uh, while we were working at Calder Bateman. And nohomophobes.com is uh, a website that scrapes hurtful homophobic language in real time off Twitter. And what was interesting when we were working on that is we were looking at the data even before we went live and we, we realized that homophobic language spiked during sporting events. So we said, we really need to do something in and around the sporting world and, and being uh, from Edmonton, living in Edmonton and having connections with the Edmonton Oilers uh, and, and other friends and folks throughout the, the NHL we felt that it was an important you know, wedge to talk about this issue of homophobia in sports because it was the, the last sport, still is the last sport uh, where there is no out professional uh, male in the NHL. Uh, there have been, uh, since Pride Tape has been launched, uh, there are several uh, players uh, in Copenhagen with John Lee Olson and in England with Zach Sullivan who have come out and, and are big supporters of Pride Tape. Uh, it, was a, it was a great opportunity. So in the last five years after reaching our Kickstarter goal, uh, that this little, little colored roll of tape uh, launched in Edmonton has now reached around the world, uh, sold in, in over 21 countries and, and every state and province in, in North America. And exciting time, as I mentioned, our, our fifth anniversary, we're actually on calls today and tomorrow with New Zealand and Australia with uh, organizations that want to bring Pride Tape into their uh, country because they believe in what we believe and that is uh, sports needs to be more inclusive and that nobody should be afraid of, of wanting to play the game that they love, whether it's hockey or any sports. We have since expanded from hockey uh, into baseball with minor league baseball and lacrosse with the Premier Lacrosse League and the National Lacrosse League. So we've gone through sports and now into things like snow shovels and barbecue utensils. So lots of fun applications with this badge of support, what started out as a, you know, from the hockey world to the LGBTQ community has certainly expanded, thanks in part to all of the support that we've received all around the world through our social media. So we're incredibly grateful, but we, we definitely have a lot more work to do. Um, I, I'm sure we can all attest to the to the hatred that we see daily uh, on social media about people, you know, feeling that they don't belong or sports isn't for them and, and we have to keep going, keep moving, keep telling our message. So certainly appreciative of this opportunity today to talk to you all uh, about what we're doing and, and hopefully you too will want to share that message and we'll just we'll just keep growing. Oh, what a great origin story. Thank you so much for that, Jeff. Really appreciate you sharing sort of uh, how it all evolved. And uh, you're right, it is such perfect timing. Happy birthday tomorrow. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, it just struck me as you were talking about that, you know, one of my good friends who's uh, a major CBC reporter talks about his journey growing up in hockey and the 
and just how terrified he always was in the dressing room that people would realize that he was gay and how much he struggled with that and that he left hockey because of it. And so it's just such an important message, um, you know, for folks to realize that they can be safe and that we need to create these environments where they are safe and, um, I just look forward to that day when a pro hockey player does come out because you know they're there. I think I wrote a blog about a year and a half ago about the diversity in hockey and how far it had to come. So this uh, continues to be a topic we need to shine a light on. And this month is Hockey for Everyone Month. And so we, uh, it's just such an opportunity to share this message forward and generate these conversations. So Tammy, I'm going to come back to you. Um, I want to delve into a time when you didn't feel like you belonged. So a personal story, your personal journey about what that looked like and felt like for you and how you navigated that. There are so many stories <laughs> when I did not feel like I belonged. Um, I would say oh, uh, maybe one about family. Um, growing up in, I'm a Cantonese Canadian born. Uh, immigrant. Um, I'm second generation. And so my, I have always had a lot of pride being part of my family. Uh, growing up, I had a lot of pride that I could speak Chinese or Cantonese specifically, um, that I knew a lot about my culture. Um, but uh, I am the third child of four. And so by the time um, I guess I came around, my older siblings and my mom and my my dad were all very in, in you know I would say because I was maybe um, born more into kind of the Canadian culture they did see me a little bit as more Canadian than 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 Cantonese so even within your own family you kind of feel that divide um, and so there was one time where I was using a Q-tip to to clean my ears uh, which is apparently a very Western thing. Um, and with my mom and sister, they kind of started giggling and said, oh, how Western of you? Um, because uh, in Chinese culture, you actually use this really thin, tiny spoon uh, to actually scrape your ears with. And it usually has a red tassel at the end. Actually, I have one uh, here as well. But um, that was a time when I was like, oh, I didn't feel like I truly belonged in that moment. Um, which was unfortunate, but obviously, even though it was a bit of a joke and it, it was kidding, you know, you feel a little bit of that sometimes. Yeah, and within your own family, right? It's uh, almost harder sometimes when it's within your own family because you expect to belong in your family. Jeff, what about you? Um, a personal journey in terms of your feeling of not belonging and how you navigated that? Well, for me, my, my story growing up as a military brat, uh, my father was in the, the Navy and the Canadian Air Force as well. So we had to move around a lot when I was a kid. And, um, but, I, but I actually really enjoyed it. Um, but I think when we, you know, I was nine years old when our, our family moved to Germany uh, to live on a base there for, for four years. Um, you know, we're enclosed, you know, on the base by fences and barbed wire. And, and, and there was, you know, a great sense of community with that, uh, but it was very isolated and insular. But as, you know, kind of precocious young kids, you want to go beyond the fence and experience, you know, what's out there around you. But when you don't speak the language, uh, you can get yourself in some situations where you're not supposed to be. Um, but what happened is, uh, which was the, I think the great part about it is, you know, playing hockey at those ages, we were able to um, play in a league with, with Denmark and Holland and Switzerland and France, and which was really exciting. And what would happen is we would go uh, to play these teams and we would be billeted out by families. So, you know, we would go into these homes where, you know, in often cases they didn't speak the language so it was difficult, but then I, I, I think I, I discovered that it's the foundation for where I am today, because I find it very exciting now to travel and, and immerse yourself in, in, in the place that you're at, rather than just going and doing the touchstone, you know, getting your picture in front of all of the, the uh, you know, the landmarks. It, I, I prefer to go into a, a town uh, wherever in the world and just immerse yourself in the culture 
for you know a month at a time and just really get to know the people and I and I found that really exciting um, but it but it certainly took some getting used to but I but I attribute it uh, certainly to my upbringing and my family you know promoting um, how important it is to just go and expand your horizons and learn other cultures uh, you know from other countries around the world so um, at first, it, it seemed like a, you know, a difficult situation, but quickly became something very positive for me uh, in my lifetime. Yeah, that's a great story, Jeff. I, uh, I similarly had a, an experience in high school living in another country and found it really lonely and isolating in many ways and didn't feel like I belonged, but also found many places there that have helped structure who I am today and how I show up for others. So thank you for sharing that. Um, let's stay with you, Jeff, and talk about sort of from those experiences to like, what are the places and spaces you feel like you belong now? And how, how does that show up for you? And how is building this company around Pride Tape helping you kind of uh, elevate that and share it forward? Well, certainly the story I just told about growing up, I think has really helped me create this community with pride tape through empathy. I mean, I, I certainly identify with all of the stories that get shared with us, uh, if not daily, weekly, on people that feel that they were not accepted in hockey or in sports or even in society. Um, uh, quick story, I was, I was here in town in Edmonton probably about a month and a half ago and uh, I was asked to come and, and bring some tape uh, to a team, uh, which I happily did. I, I got to go and with the mask on and be in the dressing room and hand out some tape and uh, saw the excitement of the players wrapping their sticks with the, with the tape. And then I went and stood beside the, uh, the door where all the players came onto the ice. And, and you know, as people were funneling onto the ice, there was, there was one young gentleman who, you know, he was by himself and I was standing there and it was a pretty lonely space in this quarantined arena. And he just looked at me, gave me a big smile, tapped his pride tape stick on the glass. And he just said, uh, this is the only place I feel I belong. And I was just like, I was really emotional, like driving home and, and thinking how negative, but how positive that was at the same time. And I was really conflicted. Um, but I think it's those individual moments that we have, whether it's through text messages or, or emails from individuals that in some instances, uh, parents have said that it's, it's saved their kids' lives. And it's, it's hard to imagine that this, you know, this little roll of colored tape that maybe we even took for granted when we started it has, has impacted uh, people's lives the way it has. And, um, you know, it, it just, it, it, it makes me feel really good that we're, you know, that we're doing something important, but as I mentioned earlier, something that we have to keep, keep doing because these messages that get shared to us, there's some, some people in some, in some tough spots, you know, where they just don't feel like they belong. And um, by showing, you know, having other ambassadors out there, like our friend, you know, Curtis Gabriel and others that have, have championed this and are, getting the message out and amplifying what we originally wanted to do is, uh, yeah, it's, in, it's inspiring. And, and again, I think I, I was saying to somebody the other day, I, I think that I actually get more from, from this than, than others do. And I, I sometimes feel guilty about that, but, but at the same time, uh, we're just really proud of all the, all the people that have taken this and championed it because we have a line that we often use, which is we just make tape, you make it powerful. Like it's, it's on everyone else to, to, to let people know that they're welcome into whether it's sports or society of their own group, it, 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 you know, like as, I, as I've seen growing up and as an adult, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of people that, that need to know that they're, they're very uh, valued, important and that they belong. So I, I, was, I was touched by that story and everyone else that, that, that we get um, every week. Wow, that, uh, that's amazing. And the story about the player, um, yeah, brought tears to my eyes. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, what incredible work. And what an incredible opportunity to build an entire movement around something as simple as hockey tape, right? Like, it seems so simple, but it's so symbolic. 
Um, Tammy, I'm going to go back to you to talk about times you belong and how you show up and what you need to be successful. Oh, in belonging, I think oftentimes it's creating safe spaces. Um, as many of us say, um, it's how do you create safe spaces and creating, especially in, in the arena of educating around diversity, equity, inclusion, because it is a sensitive space to talk about and it is uncomfortable. Um, so oftentimes when you're, you're having these conversations around, you know, what our lens are, what our biases are, it can be uncomfortable. Um, for example, I sit on um, the Brands for Better EDI um, advisory board, and oftentimes we're, we're trying to educate creatives um, on how to be more inclusive. And there's a lot of intention around wanting to be inclusive, but it, it, it's a lot of internal work. It's a lot of unlearning, relearning, figuring out, you know, how we could do it better. And because it is challenging not only in you know the tactical work that you do but also looking at your internal self and how you've seen the world um it, it takes a lot of effort um from individuals and a lot of commitment um so i feel like a lot of what we actually do is you know compassionate education um just spending the time to help people understand and learn um how their lens has impacted their work um and how to change that um um, yeah, like uh, we just did a session on educating the team on how to create programs that are actually inclusive and make people feel like they actually belong. Um, and, you know, people were saying how, you know, like, you know, this stuff actually makes you a better person in the end. And I'm, I'm glad that people are seeing that, that uh, the impact that you can have at the end of the day is, is quite profound uh, if you're willing to dedicate the time and effort into it. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just want to echo that comment around by creating a better space for those who maybe don't feel like they belong, you're actually creating a better space for everyone. And um, certainly we hear that a lot in the accessibility world and some of the disability work that I do, that if you make a space more accessible, suddenly it's better for kids and it's better for parents with strollers and all the things that were sort of these unintended consequences that just make it better for everyone. Mm -hmm. And if we could build our world around thinking about who needs it the most, we'll see how everyone actually needs it at the end of the day. Mm. Thank you for that. No problem. Actually, Jeff said something about compassion and how, um, uh, Jeff, you were saying that sometimes you feel guilty, but the, the wonderful thing about compassion, and um, I do a bit of mindfulness practice, is um, I was listening to this talk about how actually compassion gives more to the individual and gives more space to the individual than it does to um, only to others as well. So making sure we have space for others, not only ourselves, is so important, so. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, this this is such a great opportunity to, to get to have this conversation because I was thinking a lot, you know, leading up to today, of, you know, oh my God, what am I gonna say? Uh, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I thought, you know, went back to how I, how I grew up. And I, I think that uh, for me anyway, that curiosity is a very undervalued trait. Like, um, I, th I think it's fantastic to be curious about all things and all people and, and who doesn't, you know, you should want to learn uh, everybody's perspective on things. And, and uh, you know, for what we do, Tammy, in the, in the marketing world, you know, we're often dealing with, with clients or partners that are in every sector of all backgrounds and you have to learn and understand where they're coming from. And more importantly, you have to learn uh, and understand their audiences uh, so that you can make more meaningful connections with them. So, you know, the, the best way to do that, I think, is just, you know, by loving what you do, you, you have to be curious. And I, and I think that's what's kept me not only in, you know, what I do for a living, but also with, with Pride Tape. I just, I just love the fact that I've, you know, uh, at my age, you, you would think it's like, okay, I got enough friends, uh, you know, but, <laughs> but now just so many people that I've met over the last five years through Pride Tape has been incredible. Um, and just all of the backgrounds uh, from all over the world has, has just helped me grow and be more understanding and, and certainly be more empathetic, uh, you know, to, to what people are, are going through and, and then ultimately being more helpful because you understand that. So I think, yeah, I just thinking about today, uh, curiosity is certainly something that I'm, I'm proud to, to, to have. Uh, 
and, and, and love to, you know, just follow that through uh, everything that I do. And, and sometimes I think we undervalue its, its importance. Yeah, that's beautiful, Jeff. And uh, literally, we do an entire workshop working through curiosity and compassion and empathy and like looking at inclusive leadership and what are some of those traits and how do we support leaders to take some of those on and navigate that because it's not easy work. I should probably take that workshop then. <laughs> there you go. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm in. Um, Tammy, I thought what Jeff just said was kind of a perfect segue for you maybe to share a little bit about Anne Humanity's work and um, maybe some of the work we're doing together as well in terms of like how do we support clients to navigate some of what they don't know. Thanks for that, Andrea. Yes. Um, uh, what's so interesting about curiosity and, and the, the marketing industry in general is that we're, we are built off the idea of being able to understand our target demographic, right? Um, there's so much of that um, uh, structure and foundational system in marketing industry that that is, it's tough, right? Um, it, it, it perpetuates that dominant lens oftentimes because let's be honest, it's an industry that's mostly led by white cisgendered men, right? And so because of that, that lens is, is almost built into the foundation of how marketing works, everything from the survey to the design of um, uh, the, uh, the project and, and, and whatnot. So there's this uh, idea of uh, intercultural sensitivity, which is based on the Dr. Bennett um, developmental model of intercultural sensitivity, which is a mouthful, um, but it's a wonderful model. If um, you haven't heard of it, it's, it's worthwhile to take a look at. And what it talks about is um, understanding, having people have more ethno relative lens. And what that means is being able to understand that you exist with your lens and your bias, but so does everybody else, right? And in order for us to actually resonate with others, we can't expect us to be able to adopt another person's lens. We, lived experience is something that needs to be honored. And the whole idea about nothing about us uh, without us, which is, um, um, a really important term in the DI community is to know that as marketers, we can't claim to know what each community needs um, just by learning about them. Um, that's why lived experience and having individuals with lived experience as part of that design process is so important. Um, and to make sure that those voices and um, that, that piece is a part of it. One thing that we speak to as well is that um, not only lived experience, but also the ability to have intercultural sensitivity because there's a lot of internal racism in a lot of cultures and, um, and having that level of um, expertise um, is sometimes natural, but also something we need to vet as we're, we're, we're inviting people to, to the room to, to design as well. And in the work that uh, we're doing with Inclusion Incorporated, um, what's beautiful about it is that um, which is the piece that Anne Humanity is um, specializing in. Uh, and then Inclusion Incorporated um, specializes in kind of internal uh, piece as well in the organizational um, structure and, and um, work that they work hand in hand because you can't be inclusive internally and not externally and vice versa, right? And so what's beautiful about it is that when working together, we ensure that it's authentic from the beginning to the end. Um, that it's just not only one piece, right? So that's a little bit about us and how we approach the work. That's awesome, thank you. Um, and Jeff, in the uh, sort of growth evolution of Pride Tape, I'm gonna kind of flip this back to you now. Um, what, like how have you kind of co-created some of the opportunities with those that identify as part of the rainbow community? Like, what does that look like in terms of that journey for you? Well, just by sharing their stories, you know, and, and uh, again, using that, we, we often say too that, you know, Pride Tape is an opportunity for you to show your support without saying any words. So uh, we, we have that going for us by, by just, we, you know, more tape on more sticks means more messages of inclusion. Uh, whether you're part of the community or you're an ally, um, we all come together uh, to support one another. And, and, and like I said, we, we've had so many individuals from the LGBTQ community share their stories with us to help them 
for help to help us amplify their stories. And then others who mentioned earlier, like uh, companies that say, you know, hey, you do tape, but can we make a hockey stick? So now we make a hockey stick with Jason out of Winnipeg with the No Name Hockey Company. Uh, there's three different, if you can believe it, three different barbecue utensil uh, companies uh, in Canada and the United States that, that put pride tape on their barbecue utensils, again, to take it outside of sports uh, to, you know, to, again, just it's all about the amplification of, of, of messages from people uh, within the community and, and, and allies that support them. Uh, so uh, again, our, our goal is, is, is just to, to provide a platform uh, to, to tell those stories and then also help them uh, tell their stories as, as, as best we can through the amplification of our partners, uh, which have been so supportive. Oh, that's awesome. Um, we have a couple comments in the chat and a question. So um, Lynn uh, from Playocracy, who actually we've just been talking to about curiosity, so I knew she would love this conversation. She loved the comment around support without speaking. She thought that was really powerful. And then uh, we had a question earlier around um, badminton and how this, uh, Jonathan can imagine uh, the tape around the rackets, but can't really imagine how the community would be accepting of that. So just looking for some ideas about how to maybe introduce the concept of pride tape and what success you've had there. Well, there's, there, there's no question uh, about it. Again, you know, leading up to this call last night, I, I read uh, J.J. Gale's story again in the Everyday Hockey Heroes book by Bob McKenzie, who wrote about pride tape in his book, but also J.J. Gale, who, who championed, uh, you know, pride tape and, and its messages by putting it on his, you know, as, a, as, a, as an individual who wasn't out yet, put the tape on his stick and brought it into the dressing room to, to see the reaction and just to read his story and, and, and you know, hear about the, the nervousness of, of making that step uh, to put it, put it on his stick that's why it's so important for allies to do the same, uh, to show the LGBTQ community that you're welcome and everybody belongs uh, in sport. Uh, with respect to badminton, uh, again, the Premier Lacrosse League in the United States with Kyle Harrison, he, chant he saw Pride Tape and he, he called up even before the league was formed and said, we're starting this league and we want to showcase Pride Tape. Minor League Baseball in Florida called and I happened to be in Florida coincidentally and, and got the chance to meet with them and uh, they you know took it to over 70 teams within their league uh, and then what was interesting is when COVID hit and they actually had to dissolve you know the schedule in the league they said well we still want to put pride tape on our bats and we still want to do a pride campaign even though we're not playing so they had over 70 teams within their league uh, go out with messages of inclusion in their communities because, you know, it, it's just important uh, for, for all communities to just, you know, have those strong messages of belonging and inclusion. So uh, with respect to badminton, we've had uh, dodgeball, uh, you know, who want to wrap their fingers uh, with it, volleyball as well, uh, many different sports and, and I and I think that hopefully answer your question the long way around is is having the courage and bravery to do it and, and put it on put it on the stick or put it on the racket. I think what we've discovered over the five years is how there is a lot of nervousness at the beginning, but it's usually met with a hundred percent support. And that goes with the NHL on down through the grassroots organization. It's, it's, it's typically met with, with, with an embrace. And I think, you know, when we talk to our, to our group internally, it really comes down to embrace or reject. We have a choice and what are we going to do and what side, you know, of history do we want to pee on? So uh, I think it's just important uh, to embrace. And that's certainly the reaction that we seem to be getting. Uh, I mean, of course, there's the odd, you know, hateful, you know, comment or letter on social. But like with nohomophobes.com, we have actually seen the data in real time drop over the years. Uh, and, and we've seen a lot more acceptance, which is fantastic news. 
Yeah, no, that's amazing. And uh, we have comments in the chat about pride tape going to schools. Um, could we fit pride tape on our uh, shin guards for soccer? So <laughs> there's uh, lots of energy and enthusiasm for the product. Um, so I want to kind of tie back to a piece. Both of you are involved in you know, the marketing industry, both in your jobs, but also thinking about sort of that visual representation and what a powerful piece that can play in moving diversity, inclusion, belonging, and cultures of belonging forward. So Jeff, you've spoken quite a bit about sort of the impact Pride Tape can have on that. Tammy, I wanna flip back to you for a moment to talk about what that looks like in the work you're doing with clients to support them to better represent or think about who they're not representing in um, how they're showing their product, service, whatever marketing it is that you're working with them sure. on. Sure. Um, so there's this study that we reference all the time. It's uh, done by the University of Michigan, and they ex had um, nine to 12 year olds, uh, uh, just under 400 of them, uh, go through a year long study um, being exposed to media. And uh, they were tracking their self confidence over that year. Um, and they broke the cohort down um, between white males, white females, um, black males and black females. And what they found was that every cohort except for white males, um, and this was done in 2016, so there weren't as, as many dimensions, I guess, in this. Um, they found that every other cohort actually had lower self-esteem um, than except for the white males. And what we're seeing here and what this alludes to is the idea that um, media representation is very important when it comes to the impact of self-confidence. Um, and so what we always encourage um, our, our community to do, and we, we share free resources all the time on how creatives can be more inclusive in the work that they do in an everyday manner, um, is to ensure that no matter what role that's out there, um, question you know, who's playing that role. Um, if uh, you imagine, you know, if I was growing up and even to this day, being a Cantonese Canadian woman, knowing that, you know, we are a minority majority country um, by 2036 and Vancouver already is a minority majority, I still don't see myself on screen. <laughs> the reality is, and you know, like the Chinese population, not, not a small population in Vancouver. So I haven't necessarily seen myself portrayed in all these different roles. So it would be amazing if it would be possible for, for that to happen. And that's what we, we push along for. Um, Christine Sue, who's out of Toronto, who is a really amazing kind of equ equity and inclusion advocate um, has a quote, the minority is the majority. And uh, we are all a minority in some way or another, if you think about the aspects of diversity that we each bring to the table. And so I just think that's such a beautiful way to sort of reframe our conversation and the normatives that our society uh, continues to push upon us. And so I really appreciate the work, Tammy, that you and Matt are doing at Anti Humanity in let's reframe that and look at who's not there and how do we showcase them and how does that elevate how they belong in our society? Like what a powerful opportunity. Um, I wanna circle back to, Jeff mentioned allies in his last comment and we have a comment in the chat around Pride Tape has pushed my son's league in the Greater Toronto Hockey League to create inclus an inclusion course where they talk to all players and coaches to teach them how to better support teammates and other players, coaches, refs. I appreciate the life lesson that came with this for my child. It opened up conversations about acceptance and love. And I just, I wanted to comment or kind of pause there um, because allies is certainly a powerful opportunity for us all to play a role in this in small or big ways. Um, but I, I just want to check in that everyone has a definition of allyship and allies, um, because I know it's still a bit of a new term for some. So that is um, taking some sort of action towards supporting a group that's maybe facing additional barriers. And so just so that our audience all has a bit of a common understanding of that. And so Jeff, to kind of circle back to you and the power of allies in the work you're doing, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you see there and how we can all do more to move allyship forward. Well, I, I think to, 
to hope to answer that is picking up on what you said, Andrea, and, and what Tammy said as well, uh, that I think our, our kids are our greatest hope. Uh, often cases we've seen uh, kids teach their parents, you know, uh, uh, the, so the program that you mentioned in, in Toronto that's, you know, run through uh, our friends and partners that you can play are incredibly important to reach out to everyone. So to go beyond the community. And, and, and again, that was the one of the strong original intentions for Pride Tape was to get it in the hands of the allies to because it to show that everyone is welcome in sports uh, by having this badge of support on their sticks. Uh, and then certainly we we started learning along our journey over the five years that the kids, the young, the young people are really gonna make this happen for us. They seem to be further ahead of the parents. I mean, there's, there's one story where uh, one uh, young woman in, in, in the US had come out um, at the age of 14 and immediately the parents, you know, just didn't want her on the team, didn't want her on the road with the team because they stay at the hotel and they go into the pool and and they just weren't happy with that. Um, and, and so, you know, ultimately uh, that child went and found a team that was more accepting uh, and, and, and gave her a greater sense of belonging. So um, but that's just horrific uh, to know that it was the parents that were the issue here uh, and, and making this child feel that they, that they don't belong. It wasn't the issue with the other kids. They didn't have a problem. Uh, you know, with, with their teammates. So, and, and oftentimes we find through the correspondence that that's the case. So, you know, we, we, I think, you know, we try hard to keep working with young people um, within the community and, and with allies to show that uh, they have a large role to play here uh, with acceptance. Um, and, 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 but, but by connecting with the kids, we're, we're very hopeful uh, like I mentioned earlier, we've got a long way to go, but we're hopeful with the attitudes of the young people and 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 how they're willing and the allies are willing to, to you know, to to give that sense of acceptance and belonging uh, to everyone. We we're we're certainly making strides. So I think the 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 kids are the are are the are hopefully a big answer for us. Yeah, I certainly hope so. Hopefully they uh, make some better choices than some of us have made along the way. Um, Tammy, do you want to kind of respond or layer on to that in terms of your experience and where you think allies show up? Yeah, for sure. What what um, interesting, like what a interesting story. I think one um, thing that we see in data, for example, is that about 10 years ago, only 10% of the population identified in the rainbow community. And now it's 20% and a, a huge majority of that is in the millennial and Gen Z population. Um, and some of our DIA experts um, say that that's possibly because, you know, there's more terms within that community where people can identify with, you know, um, everywhere from non-binary to gender queer um, and allowing people to, to, to really uh, self-identify more accurately uh, instead of just, you know, male, female gay, lesbian, you know what I mean? There's there's so much more, uh, which is such a wonderful thing. I think um, allyship is ongoing, it's hard work. Uh, it takes a lot of dedication over time and um, we try our best to do it by creating a community of creatives that we can tap into on a regular basis that we, we mutually educate um, and they educate us and, and try to create a safe space for us to to learn the skills and the, the, the support that we need in order to help push our bosses and our bosses' bosses and our clients um, to be more inclusive. Um, it's, it's hard work, but it, it, takes, um, it takes a community. And we often say that um, this stuff doesn't happen without the privilege um, helping, so. Mm, what an interesting statement that uh, it doesn't happen without privilege helping. Um, so what's next for each of you? Like, tell us where you see this work going and what's needed to continue to build cultures of belonging as we move forward. Tammy, do you want to lead off? Sure. Um, we're providing a lot of, um, free resources and, um, free training sessions to a lot of organizations. We've 
we've educated, you know, everywhere from Arcteryx to one to three West to uh, different organizations. And we want to continue to do that. Um, I think it's the best way to um, spread knowledge and, and share information so that um, there's a stronger impact in the, the greater marketing community. Um, so that's definitely something that we're, we're, we're doubling down on. So. Awesome. Jeff, what about you? Where's Pride Tape going? Is it going to um, take on other topics or is it staying Pride Tape? How's it, and you've mentioned a little bit about the growth, but like, what's the vision? Where's it going? Well, for us, it, with the tape itself, it starts with, you know, more tape is more messages on more sticks or more sporting equipment or barbecue utensils or whatever you want to put it on to show, to, you know, to show those around you that that, that you believe in, in inclusion in sport and society. Um, but, you know, we often hear from folks that don't play sports, that, that believe in the messages that we have. We've had folks that have wrapped the tape around the railings of their balconies. Uh, they'll put it on their cars, which is probably not great for the car, but we appreciate the support. Um, but uh, uh, we are just near the finishing uh, touches of our, of our first uh, children's book. Uh, called Who's Hockey, and that's in partnership with the NHL and uh, in line with their declaration of principles that they launched several years ago. So we're doing a series of the eight words that make up their declaration of, of principles and going in alphabetical order. The first one is about acceptance. So we're, we're, we're super stoked about that. And it actually shares uh, some of my story of growing up and moving from place to place and how difficult that is. Uh, and, and, and just being welcomed in, into uh, a new environment um, and the importance of that. And, and so it's, it's a fun story. We're excited to, to get that out and work on, on that series. And, and uh, we're also working on other products like uh, hoodies with the NHL and, and other things again, so that you know, the tape is, is, is one way to show your support uh, for inclusion, but it, you know, it's, it's restrictive to to the game or to the sport and so we're just looking at other ways to to basically you know springboard off of that original idea of of just making sport communities uh more inclusive and and, and what other ways uh can we do that the same way that the tape has has impacted people oh that's so awesome i want a hoodie sign me up <laughs> <laughs> done <laughs> um and yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a sidebar, but I, I love sort of all of the thinking about like, how does this become bigger than one thing? You've talked about the growth in sports, you've talked about the growth in countries, the growth in allies, and those representing and showcasing the product. It's just such a powerful tool. And when you started, like, did you imagine where this would all go? Five years, five years tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been really exciting. And, and like I said, it's all a testament to all of the people out there, the ambassadors that, that believe that, that these messages are important. And again, they make it powerful. But I'll also note, though, too, is that we do have a long way to go. Uh, we'd like to connect with, with corporations that, that believe in this and also big, you know, big media. Um, we, we've got fantastic coverage. Uh, from, from, you know, the, the people, the ambassadors that, that believe in it, but we, we wanted to cut through, like we wanted to, to make it, you know, a major, a major story across North America and beyond, because we feel all the hard work everybody's done uh, to champion this, the, the story deserves to be told. And right now we feel a lot of the story has been told within our own circles. And uh, we, we just, again, need to, to, to make it bigger. And, and it's, it's been very interesting because five days, or sorry, five days, five, feels like five days sometimes, but five years uh, has gone by so quickly that every day we feel like we're, we're just starting anew. You know, like, for example, when I mentioned New Zealand and Australia, you know, they're just finding out about it and, and, and running with it. So so it, it does have a bit of a Groundhog Day uh, vibe to it, and, and, and the story is just starting, but we certainly would like to, to get up over that precipice and, and make it more widely known of not only what we're doing, but all of the people that feel it's important, uh, you know, 
showcase them and 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 certainly I can't mention Curtis Gabriel's name enough uh, who's with the San Jose Sharks organization he's taken it upon himself uh, to as an ally to speak for the LGBTQ community as well as uh, Black Lives Matter and, and and other really social important social issues to him um, you know we need more Curtis's so uh, and he's working hard at that too so uh, yeah the more that we can again, engage and, and make more friendships like we have today. Um, that's, that's what we look to do. So anybody that wants to talk to us, we're always happy to chat about how we can help. Yeah, no, that's an awesome offer. And um, we do send out an email later today with uh, the link to the session. And if you want, we can certainly, we'll share the Pride Tape um, website, but if you want to share your direct connection, we can also do that. So you can let us know. Um, Thank you power of partnerships to each of you in driving cultures of belonging. Um, Jeff, I know you have several partners that you're working with. Tammy, I know you have partners as well. What do you think that looks like in terms of how that can really amplify our work and the need? We know there's a need for this work. So how do we kind of leverage those to move it forward? So Tammy, maybe I'll kick it over to you first. Um, you know, like we said, we, we, we can't push any tip for, anything forward, you know, just by yourself. You need a community and, and multiple communities. Um, we're lucky to have fantastic partners uh, like yourself um, and like uh, the, the creative um, creatives in our, our network that are often pushing that. We have advisors that are DEI experts and um, who continue to support us and others in the creative industry that um, really believe that this work is important and continue to push that. So. I think partnerships are, are, are integral to any impact that you want to create. So. Yeah, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly with Tammy. If, if it wasn't for our, our partners, we wouldn't exist. I mean, it started with, you know, we needed the Kickstarter campaign to produce the first 10,000 rolls of tape. So we needed people to buy in and believe in what we were doing. So the beauty about a Kickstarter campaign is it is it brings on site supporters by its very nature and those supporters become ambassadors. So the, the NHL called us even before the tape was produced and said, we wanna, we wanna help, we wanna be a part of this, as well as uh, our partners, the You Can Play team uh, have, have been integral. And then, and then from there, it's grown. You know, as I mentioned, uh, baseball, uh, which the NHL put us in contact with, with minor league baseball and, and so many others because Let's face it, without it, as a small group, um, we would only be scratching the surface, surface of, our, of our messaging. So that, that amplification was absolutely critical to our success, and it still is today. Like, we're, we're still just getting it into some national retailers uh, in North America. We need to do more of that because we, got, we, we have to get the tape to the people uh, so that they can purchase it uh, even beyond our, our website. So... Um, you know, important retail partners have been critical, um, but it, it, it's all started thanks, you know, to our to our friends at the NHL and has, has grown from there. But without them, we wouldn't exist. It's that simple. And just for our listeners knowledge, what retailers can they get tape from in Canada? Uh, you can get it at a lot of the independents uh, nationwide, you know, your so check with your local source for sports. Uh, retailer throughout the Maritimes all the way out, you know, past Vancouver, beyond. Uh, Sport Check as well, you can get that in store or online. Uh, some Canadian tires, uh, we're looking to get more. Um, but yeah, it, it, it has, a, has a nice presence, but uh, certainly COVID has been difficult with, with a lot of minor hockey uh, shutting down to make sure everyone's safe. Uh, with, it, with the absence of hockey and other sports, certainly uh, there's that decline, but, um, you know, thankfully with the promotion coming up with, with NHL through February and beyond and, and, and kids, you know, coming back a little bit, um, there's the need for the tape, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been an interesting year to, to, to say the least on, on the tape front, but, uh, we hope that, uh, everybody's safe and, and everybody comes back healthy and there's, there's need uh, for that tape. But what's interesting, Andrea and Tammy, is that like the creativity of folks has just blown us away. Like, 
you know, we created this tape and then all of a sudden, you know, people are putting it in into the numbers of their hockey jerseys on their backs or they're, they're putting it on, you know, uh, uh, generators, axe handles, uh, bicycles, as I mentioned, you know, hand, hand railings. It, it's even been on walkers and canes uh, from, from the elderly community who really believe in its messages uh, some folks have sent us pictures of that as well. So, so, so again, uh, just trying to keep getting it out there. And, and uh, but yeah, people can get it from a few locations, but primarily uh, you can get it from pridetape.com. Awesome. That's fantastic. I'm uh, sure that's some great social media messaging when you get some really innovative ways that people are using the tape. <laughs> that's uh, awesome. It always blows us away. Like every yeah. week there's something where it's like, okay, I never thought of that. So yeah. it's, it's fun. It makes it fun. Totally. Um, we just have a couple minutes left. So I want to ask you what each kind of one last question slash closing comment. Um, your journey of belonging, you've navigated that um, yourselves. You've kind of figured out what works for you, sometimes with more success, sometimes uh, it's more challenging. You've created organizations where you're really br bringing the opportunity of belonging to the broader society. Um, what would what are you kind of doing to support your internal team in belonging? So that's my final question to you. So Jeff, you're working with obviously several others. I'm sure not as big a team as you probably need on Pride Tape. And Tammy, you have um, two beautiful marketing agencies in Vancouver that you're running. So maybe uh, Tammy, I'll flip it back to you to just tell us a little bit about what you're doing around belonging internally. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of it comes down to education. Um, our team does uh, weekly um, DEI training and uh, mini assignments uh, all the way. And I think it's uh, the team's response has been really positive um, in the sense that they feel like, um, as I said, we're almost better people uh, as we're going through this journey. Uh, we have advisors that continue to teach us about what that looks like, but oftentimes it's just ensuring that we provide as many um, options uh, for people to reach out if there is something that we can do better to create safe spaces for um, um, constructive feedback and um, ensuring that everyone is heard uh, as they are uh, and accommodating the needs and the unique needs of um, every individual uh, and what they're going through. So. Uh, COVID has been a very interesting time, so um, that looks very different for everybody, and we're we're doing our best to make sure that everyone feels, you know, uh, like they're they can be fully present. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. How about you? Yeah, I think in in Pride Tape's case, uh, to to echo what Tammy said, you know, collaboration is absolutely critical, uh, and we're fortunate within the Pride Tape group that we we do that often but now we also have the collaboration with everybody around the world uh, that supports us so um, it's it's giving ourselves the opportunity to do it it's difficult because i mentioned off the top is is that uh, the role on the pride tape team is is a volunteer time and and we have to you know do our call them real jobs and and, and so oftentimes you know, the pride tape correspondence happens off the corner of our desks, but we're very fortunate that, that all the people that support us are doing the lion's share of the work. You know, they're doing the heavy lifting, they're doing the, the outreach in the community and we feed off their creativity and, and discuss it as a team and see how we can help them or get other partners involved to help them. Um, but so, so collaboration when we have the time is, is, is the foundation for how we can just keep things moving and, and help create, again, that, that larger sense of belonging, not only internally with our own group, but externally with all the people that support us. Beautiful, thank you for that. Um, and thank you both so much for being here. I know you both have incredibly busy schedules and uh, you're doing such incredible work. And I'm just so, so grateful that you could join us today and share your stories and talk about the power of um, the marketing world and the visuals that can really connect us around supporting each other to move forward to cultures of belonging. So thank you very, very, very much. Um, Thank you so much for, yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, a lot of fun.
Yeah, no, what a great pairing. I always appreciate how our pairings show up for this. Um, in wrap up, I just want to share our uh, next session is uh, coming up on February 23rd. It will be conversation at number 23, I believe, um, and uh, on the 23rd. And we have um, Ali Virgie, who's with the Toronto Police Service doing diversity and inclusion work, as well as with a startup company in Toronto, and um, Regional Chief Kulani Adamak um, from the Assembly of First Nations. She lives in the Yukon um, in Kulani National Park. And so we're uh, super excited to welcome both of them for our next conversation for Bridges of Belonging. And you can register on our website. Thank you everyone who joined us today and special thanks to Jeff and Tammy for being here. Stay safe, stay well, and um, make sure you spread the love in February. Thanks so much. Thank you.